Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Dean's Conversation Series. This is incredibly special because we have not one, but two Illinois Supreme Court justices with us. I'm going to introduce one of them, and then she will be introducing the second one. Uh, Justice Ann Burke um, received her undergraduate degree from DePaul. She received her JD from IT, IT Chicago Kent. She has done many things in her life and her career. Before she actually became a lawyer, she was a gym teacher. And it's a great story, and if you haven't heard it, I hope that maybe she'll expound a little bit, but get to know her and get to know this fantastic story. After she went back and got her law degree, she held a variety of positions, including as judge on the Court of Claims. She served as special counsel to the governor for child welfare services. She has been a justice on the appellate court for the first district. And of course, she is now a justice on the Illinois Supreme Court. Another thing that's very special about her is her connection to the Special Olympics. This has been a cause near and dear to her heart. She has talked to us about that, and we commend her for not only that volunteer service, but her many other professional and community activities. So please join me in welcoming Justice Burke. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, students and guests. Welcome to the John Marshall Law School, and thank you for joining us today for a meaningful and thought-provoking exchange of ideas featuring my, the honorable colleague, Justice P. Scott Neville, Jr. of the Illinois Supreme Court, and Dean Darby Dickerson. Now, Dean Dickerson, I think you might know, as, as I might add, was recently named President-Elect of the Association of American Law Schools for 2019. I don't know whether or not I should give you condolences or congratulations, but I think <laughs> condo congratulations. For <laughs> she will serve as president during the 2020 calendar year. So congratulations again, Dean. Thank you. It was 10 years ago uh, when, at the urging of my good friend Lance Northcutt, uh, the Justice uh, Ann Burke Professionalism Series was launched. The purpose, of course, uh, was to bring together some of the brightest and best legal minds in the Illinois Bar and the judiciary to participate in a public forum where they could share their life experiences and their ideas and suggestions. The goal of the program has been to demonstrate how professional values may be advanced through the exercise of sound judgment and by upholding all the standards and the ethics. In the last few years, of course, the program has been held in collaboration with Dean Dickerson and her Conversations with the Dean interview program, which I think is an excellent, excellent venue. The discussion you will hear today is of importance as our aspiring future lawyers um, gather here in this room but will also be of great interest to our established practitioners. And I have just one suggestion for you, and I know uh, Justice Neville may be not like this, but um, one of the suggestions I would personally say is, this may be the only chance you get to ask a Supreme Court judge a question, so do it. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Dickerson will interview Justice Neville, who is currently no stranger to the students and faculty and alumni of John Marshall Law School. You know him, of course, as uh, one of Illinois' most outstanding jurists, making significant contributions in the realms of employment law, civil rights, and civil litigation, and through the appellate review over the course of his long distinguished career. On June 16th of this last year, Justice Neville, who had served on the Illinois Appellate Court since 2004, was sworn in as the 117th Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court succeeding former Chief Justice Charles E. Freeman, the fifth longest serving justice in the Supreme Court's history. Justice Freeman, of course you all know, is a graduate of John Marshall Law School. Justice Neville uh, is a graduate of Washington University School of Law, is a native Chicagoan who has been actively practicing law in Illinois since 1974 when he clerked for the late Illinois Appellate Court Justice Glenn T. Johnson. 
1979, Justice Neville became a principal with the law firm of Neville and Ward. Two years later, he established P. Scott Neville Jr. and Associates. The firm was later merged with House, House Neville and Gray. Justice Neville is an active member of several bar associations, is a past president of the Cook County Bar Association, and a member of several judicial organizations. And he's also been liaison, pointed by the Illinois Supreme Court to, as liaison to many of the Supreme Court committees, one of which, I think I called it, I to you, Bond Court. <laughs> In 1997, he co-founded the Alliance of Bar Associations for Judicial Screening, and this group was comprised of 11 separate bar associations working collaboratively to advance standards of diversity, equality, and fairness in judicial evaluations. Justice Neville has been the honored recipient of numerous awards, including the Bar Association's prestigious Vanguard Award. In 2007, he received the Washington University School of Law, uh, an award which was, was presented with the Distinguished Alumni Award, and in 2016, he was named one of the most distinguished men of the Illinois Continuing Academic Training Children and Youth Services. In 2017, the Cook County State's Attorney, Kimberly Fox, presented Justice Neville with the Stratford Award. In a career filled with superlatives, he has also been an instructor at the University of Chicago Law School in its intensive trial practice workshop. So at this time, it is my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce my colleague and friend, the newest member of the Illinois Supreme Court, the Honorable P. Scott Neville. Let me thank Justice Burke for that very kind and generous introduction, but I think you need to acknowledge her one more time. What was left out is in September of 2019, Justice Burke will become the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. So ladies, if you ever had any doubts about what you can do, just look at Justice Burke. She is going to be the leader of our court, and I look forward to working with her. So without any further ado, Justice Neville, thank you for being with us. Justice Burke, thank you for the decade that you've spent working with us on this program. Can everyone hear me? Sounds like my mic is not picking up. Okay. Uh, you come from a family of lawyers. Talk to us about how you came to the law, what your progression has been in making that decision, and, and how you got to the point where, we, where Justice Burke picked up. Well, let me say this. I think it's important for me to start by saying that I grew up in Bronzeville. There is a great historian in the city of Chicago. His name is Timuel Black. Timuel Black refers to the area that I grew up in as sacred ground. It's sacred ground because when blacks migrated from the south to the city of Chicago, that's the area that they settled in. And my family was no different. For most of my life, I have lived in the area that's bordered by 26th Street on the north, 63rd Street on the south, Cottage Grove on the east, and State Street on the west. That is the area that's known as Bronzeville. I grew up attending segregated but public schools in the city of Chicago. I went to Forestville Grammar School and DuSable High School. The reason that I make that point is it doesn't make any difference where you go to school. It's more important what you get out of the school that you go to. So after leaving DuSable High School, I went on, graduated from Culver Stockton College, and then I went to Washington University School of Law. The question was, I'm from a family of lawyers. She's, she's right. My father was an attorney, but unfortunately he died when I was 13 years old. He had a brother who was also an attorney. But they passed that information on to the next generation. 
I had, I'm an attorney, but my youngest sister is also an attorney. Now, she's more of a transactional attorney. But I think it might be important to talk about my sister very briefly. My sister did not go to Washington University, but she went to Yale undergrad and Yale Law School. But I always remind her that she's not sitting on the Illinois Supreme Court. <laughs> so yes, I'm from a family of lawyers. This also might be the appropriate time to talk about John Marshall Law School. Whenever I come over here, I have to remind students at this school, when I walk through your Hall of Fame, that John Marshall Law School must be a judge track. There are more judges on the Circuit Court of Cook County from John Marshall than I think any other law school in the country. So I, I just want to congratulate you for that and thank you, the professors and, and the administration for the fine job you do of training lawyers because you've done an exceptional job. And I am here today because I recognize that you are the next generation of leaders. You are the people who are going to become the legislators the judges, the governors, maybe even presidents. So I'm here, I think I have a responsibility or a duty to come and speak to you, and it's a high honor to be here this afternoon. A lot of the students have some sense as to what an Illinois Supreme Court justice <coughs> does, but they probably don't have a complete sense. So can you talk to us about what a normal day looks like when you're in session and when you're not in session? Because as we talked about, you're always working. I'm always working. Yesterday was a court holiday. I was in the office working. But I'd say a normal day when I'm in Chicago involves we get motions constantly. We also get petitions for leave to appeal. And that petition is your passport to the Illinois Supreme Court. But what you must understand is the Supreme Court has what's referred to as discretionary jurisdiction. We get to pick and choose. Now the Constitution does provide that there are certain cases that we must take. We must take revenue cases, we must take petitions for writs of mandamus. But the remainder of the cases we take, we can pretty much decide. But you always have to go back to the Constitution because the Constitution provides that we will not take a case unless there are four votes. In fact, the Constitution provides that no action is taken in the Supreme Court without four votes. So when I'm sitting in the city, we are, I am reviewing motions, petitions for leave to appeal, but we also spend a lot of time writing opinions. Now, while I don't write as many as I wrote when I was on the appellate court, I think the, the goal is to try to write 100 a year. On the Supreme Court, we're dealing with much more complex issues, so we spend a lot of time. On the appellate court, I had two law clerks. On the Supreme Court, I have four, and I need every one of them because we are dealing with some really complex things. Finally, as Justice Burke pointed out, we are also on committees. I'm responsible for three committees, so I spend time on community or on committee work. Now, when we go to Springfield, the, there are five terms of court. There's a January term, a March term, a May term, a September term, and a December term. Those terms usually last two weeks. The first day of the term, we handle administrative business, character and fitness issues, issues that the head of the AOIC may have. We might deal with some committee issues, but it's all business. The remainder of the term, we spend hearing cases. We hear a lot of oral arguments. I had a little culture shock during my first term of, in September of last year. The Supreme Court has been complaining because the appellate court justices do not hear enough oral arguments. During my first term of the Illinois Supreme Court, we heard, I think, 24 oral arguments. That's more oral arguments than I had heard in a year on the appellate court, so I was somewhat overwhelmed. 
But, you know, we spend a lot of time hearing, hearing those oral arguments and then we decide those cases. So my work in Chicago is a little different from my work in Springfield. Springfield, we generally spend time hearing the oral arguments and making decisions. And of course, we have an impression vote after the oral arguments take place. In Chicago, it's more administrative. I'm considering the motions, the PLAs, I'm going and meeting with my committees and just doing handling administrative matters. It is a lot of work. I didn't realize how hard the Supreme Court justices work. I think they work harder than the appellate court justices. And I think it should be appropriately said that the best job in the Illinois court system is the Illinois appellate court. For some, but I'm, I, I like the Supreme Court better. <laughs> for, for some of our students who might not have heard Justice Burke talk about this last year, could you talk a little bit about the chambers you have in Springfield? Because I think that will surprise some people. Yes. Not just you, but all of the justices. Well, you know, that's why I, I like and love Justice Burke so much. I didn't realize it, that the Supreme Court justices, we live literally over the Supreme Court courtroom. And it's very interesting. We each have an office and a bedroom. It's like a little suite. But it's also a work area. In my chambers, I have a computer. I have a printer. So when we're not hearing cases, I can go into my chambers and do what my grandmother always said, study my lesson. I can prepare for the next day. And there are always cases to read, always new cases coming in. But I can get a lot of work done. Now, what you may not know is this is for budgetary reasons, because in addition to this space being provided to us, we also have someone who prepares meals. And my brother will often contact me and say, Scott, we're spending all that money on you. What did you have for dinner? Or what did you have for lunch? So I explained to him one day, I said, well, we had a very economical lunch today. We had tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. I think, I'm sure you're not going to complain about the money that was spent. But it, it, it's a very collegial atmosphere. You know, you, you enjoy working with all the people who are there. We try to discuss all of our business when we're in the impression conference room. But another thing I had to adjust to is we have assigned seats at the dinner table. You can't just go in and sit wherever you want to sit. We have an assigned seating plan, but we sit in the same seats that we sit in when we're in the impression conference room. So that's one of the customs and practices that the Illinois Supreme Court has, and I didn't have a problem in adjusting to it. I think custom is good, so, and this was one that's very workable and manageable, and I guess it's also good because Justice Burke sits right next to me. So it works very, very well. You've been incredibly successful. Can you talk to us about some of the people who've been most influential on your life? Well, you know, I think it's important for me to emphasize this, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think anybody gets where they are by themselves. And I almost want to repeat that. Nobody gets where they are by themselves. Of course, I had a very dedicated family my mother and grandmother, because my, as I indicated to you, my father died when I was 13. They were committed to me. And I think my mother's philosophy that you cannot say can't, my mother would not permit me to tell her that I could not do something. She refused to accept the word can't. So that was my foundation. I have four sisters and one brother. And they were always very supportive, and we were always very competitive. And even though we grew up in an area that's considered to be poor and where there are a lot of disenfranchised people, my mother insisted that we all graduate from college, and everybody did. So, you know, we, we just grew up working very hard. I can often remember holidays at my house. And regardless as to whether or not there was a holiday, we still had to get up. My grandmother insisted that we get up and have some kind of project to work on. 
And it was that kind of discipline that worked very well for me. But I had a mentor when I was at Culver Stockton College. His name was John Sperry. He was my advisor, a history and political science teacher. When I went on to Washington University, I had a property professor. And his name was Mr. Becker. And I don't know, some of you are second or third year students, but I still remember that rule against perpetuity, a life in being in 21 years. Now what's very interesting about that rule is during the 12 years I was on the, or 14 years, I was on the appellate court, I had an occasion to use that rule. So it was very important to, to understand it. So I, I've gone through college and law school. Now let's talk about the legal profession. The first job I ever got was a job as a law clerk on the Illinois Appellate Court. And I always like to tell people I was the first black man to ever clerk for an Illinois Appellate Court Justice. What was significant about that, and it's something that the young people in this room need to think about, I was not the judge's first choice. The judge's first choice was a man he knew who graduated from an Ivy League law school. But the man turned the job down. He went to work for a big law firm. But after a five or six year period, he was no longer with the law firm. And he's not on the Illinois Supreme Court. So those first choices make a, make a big difference. Of course, the reason he made the decision he made was because he was getting paid a lot more money, like five to six times what he would have made as a law clerk. So you need to keep that in mind as you make decisions. You know, is this big paycheck at the very beginning, is it going to work out for me in the end? So Justice Glenn Johnson, who was my first employer, was also a big, big advocate for me, advocate and advisor. He also taught me something. He said, Scott, this is the way I define success. He said, success is being successful 51% of the time. I've used that as my measure of success. If, I'm, if I make good decisions 51% of the time, since I'm on the Supreme Court, I'd like to think I've made some pretty good decisions. But he was one mentor. Another mentor of mine is a man who served on the circuit court and the Illinois appellate court he was a very famous criminal lawyer. His name was R. Eugene Pynchon. And I got an opportunity to work with him later on in my career before I became a judge. The thing I learned from Justice Pynchon was he had an indomitable spirit. I can recall we sued the city of Chicago and we challenged the map dividing the city into wards. And we had a judge at 219, right across the street from this law school. His name was Brian Duff. And Judge Duff put us off the case. So I said to Justice Pynchon, well, I guess we'll go, have to go and find another case. He said, Scott, the case is not over. I'm here to report the Seventh Circuit reversed the decision and Judge Duff never heard another case because he was exercising poor judgment. But he just taught me that it doesn't make any difference if you lose. You know, you have to be willing to challenge that result. I recall him saying to me after we were put off the case, he said, Scott, we don't have anywhere to go but up, so let's not worry about it. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Justice Charles Freeman, my mentor. Justice Charles Freeman appointed me to the Circuit Court of Cook County in 1999. After I'd served on the circuit court for maybe three and a half years, he appointed me to the Illinois Appellate Court. 
where I served for some 14 years. And then in May of 2018, I'm sitting in my chambers preparing for an oral argument. It's about 8.45 in the morning. My secretary's not there. I get, I would always come down to the Belanding building early on oral argument days, so I was there. And I get a, the phone rings, I pick it up, it's Justice Freeman. So Justice Freeman said, Scott, how are you? I said, very well. He said, would you like to be on the Illinois Supreme Court? <coughs> now that's an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> so I told him, I'd very much like to be on the Supreme Court. <coughs> now remember, he's an alumnus of this law school. So he said, Scott, there's one problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, if, you, if I elevate you to the Supreme Court, you will have to resign your position on the, the appellate court. What you need to understand is, when I moved from the circuit court to the appellate court, my position remained there. I was just assigned to the appellate court. I was just temporarily on the appellate court. But when he elevated me from the appellate court to the Supreme Court, he said, you have to give up your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes things just work for the best. In December of 2017, the pension people called me and they said, Justice Neville, your pension has vested and you don't have to pay any more money into the pension plan. Well, what, that, what they were really telling me is you, you can retire now if you'd like. So I wasn't ready to go. So when Justice Freeman asked me if I was willing to give up my position, I said, I'm ready to go. I can retire. So I'm ready to, I can go today if you'd like for me to come up. Well, he wasn't quite ready. And, you know, he, he said, okay, I'll get back to you. And the decision was made. And fortunately for me, Justice Burke was there to swear me in. So I, I will always be eternally grateful to her for that. So I've talked about the many mentors I've had. I can't, you know, I, I'd spend all day talking about the people who have been praying for me. They're an inordinate number. My mother always told me that my one shortcoming was I did not have faith. And that is to be able to take a chance when you couldn't see where the next step is. And sometimes you have to move by faith and not by sight. So I'm a lot older than you. I may be the oldest person in the room, but I am now moving by faith and not by sight. But it's very important. And you know, maybe it's important for me to stop at this point in time and say, you know, I make decisions. I sit in judgment of people all the time. But as a man of faith, although there's a separation in the Constitution between church and state, but as a man of faith, I, want, I think that one day I too will be judged. And Justice Pinchin reminded me about the importance of always being fair to people. Justice Burke has reminded me about the importance of hearing the other side. Well, when I meet St. Peter, Justice Freeman said, if you, or Justice Pinchin said, if you've been fair to people, when you get to the gate, you don't want any debate. Well, when I meet St. Peter, I don't want any debate. I just want him to let me come in. So you mentioned Justice Freeman. Are there any other judicial heroes that you've, you've had through the years, people you looked up to on the court? Well, certainly the three men that I mentioned, Justice Johnson, Justice Pinchum, Justice Freeman. You know, how could I not revere um, the first Article III judge, black judge in the continental United States, who, James Parsons. Of course, everybody wants to be like Thurgood Marshall. I mean, that was my dream. I never thought I'd become a judge. I thought I was going to be going down 
to Mississippi and Alabama fighting for the rights of the disenfranchised, the people who are left out and not thought about. So I, I certainly re revered all of those men. I'm gonna ask two more questions and give everyone fair notice, but then we'll open it up to some audience questions, okay? So what is your definition of leadership? I think a leader is a person who sets a good example for other people. I think you have to lead by example. I think as a judge, I've been a mentor. You have to make sure that your mentees understand that they're supposed to get to court on time. While they require the lawyers to be prepared, I think they should be prepared as well. But I think a good leader leads by example and just sets the benchmark that he expects everybody else to meet. But you do it by example. Justice, Justice Burke has been a, a great mentor for me. She's been leading by example. I'm watching her as she's moving to become Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. I'm watching her as she, she questions people during oral arguments. She's been a very good mentor for me. But I think you have to lead by example. She set a good example for me and the other members of the court. Talk to us, share some thoughts about the importance of diversity to the legal profession. Well, diversity might, it still remains the biggest problem that the United States has had to deal with. It's a problem that we must resolve. I think the Illinois Supreme Court, much to my surprise, has been working on this. The court has done a study on implicit and unconscious bias because they recognize the importance of everyone receiving equal justice under law. Equal justice to me means that no person should be unseen and no person should be unheard. But let's just think about the city of Chicago and the county of Cook. It's a very diverse society. Everybody has a right to be heard. Everybody has a right to be respected and to be treated fairly. And I think that that's every judge's greatest challenge, to make sure that when a litigant comes into the courtroom, they feel that they've received all the process they were due. It brings to mind an experience I had when I was on the appellate court I was sitting with a justice who was the senior member of the court. And of course, there are rules that govern everything that, that the court does. I always like to remind people we're a society of laws, not of men. But there are rules that govern how long the oral argument is supposed to take. And our rules provide that each side is supposed, I'm, I'm talking about for the appellate court, each side is supposed to get 20 minutes. Now, I explained that there are, a lot, there are a lot of customs and traditions. It, on the appellate court, each person gets to serve as the presiding justice. And I'd been on the court long enough and I was presiding. The presiding judge controls the clock. You get to tell people that they've run out of time. Well, I had a few experiences at the Seventh Circuit where I didn't think I received all the process I was due. So I am very reluctant and have never told a person they were out of time. So I'm sitting there with this senior justice and after 20 minutes it expired, he touched me on my arm and he said, Scott, their time is up. I said, I understand, they, they'll be finished in a minute. So they continued to argue and five additional five minutes went by or expired. He said, Scott, their time is up. I said, Justice Campbell, everything's fine. We don't have any more oral arguments today, so what difference does it make? So they completed their argument. Now I can't report to you how that case turns out, but I would like to think that at the end of the day that litigant felt they had received all, of, all the process they were, they were due. So you know, we, we often model our system on the scales of justice. If you come to my chambers, you see a lot of scales. It reminds me and maybe reminds my colleagues that our goal is to make sure that everybody receives equal justice, that we don't treat people differently because they're black or white, or rich or poor, or male or female, 
or gay or, or, or something else, that we treat everybody the same, gay or disabled, whatever it may be, that everybody is treated the same. So we lit, diversity is very important. I think it's important for us to have a diverse court. I recently appeared at an event with the Chief Justice. And the Chief Justice pointed out, and I think he's correct, that, that the goal is to one day have a diverse, a diverse bench so that when people look at the, the bench as a whole, they will see a reflection of themselves. And I think that's the goal, so that our bench reflects the society that they work for. Thank you. Cody has a microphone. So if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand. Wait for him to bring the microphone to you. Hello. Oh, okay. um, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Um, you touched on equal justice, and I was curious what your own personal definition of just justice was and how that's changed, if at all, throughout your service um, in various courts. You know, it might be appropriate, and that's why I brought this notebook, since this is Black History Month, to quote Martin Luther King. When you ask me what my concept of justice is, I think you're asking me, how do I make decisions? Well, think about something that justice or that Dr. Martin Luther King said. He said, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? He said, expedience will ask the question, is it politically correct? He said, vanity will ask the question, is it popular? He said, but conscience asks the question, is it right? then goes on to say, and there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politically correct nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. My system of justice is doing what I think is right at the end of the day, what I think is right. You know, I often, I think it's important for me to tell you which is why I know the Supreme Court isn't biased, that while I sat on the Illinois Appellate Court, I was probably reversed more in criminal cases than any other justice on the court, since they voted and permitted me to join them on the Supreme Court. I can see they didn't hold it against me. But you see, I was taking positions that I thought were, were right. Thurgood Marshall said, you do what is right and let the law catch up with you. I know you guys have questions. I just know. Yeah. Yes. Professor Cross. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, my name is Karen Cross. Um, and thank you again for coming. Um, you just said, do what's right and let the law catch up with you. And so as a follow-up to that, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, what that means in the context of judicial precedent. Very important. Our, our country is built on a, on a system of stare decisis. Precedent governs. But you see, the thing that changes is Facts change. The, the law remains the same, but facts change. I think when I think about precedent, we have to think about Plessy versus Ferguson, see? separate but equal. That was the law, but it wasn't right. So it needed to be changed. And of course, the change took place in Brown versus the Board of Education. So. I think it gets back to what I just said, is it right? You know, yes, we are supposed to follow precedent, but that's what the Supreme Court is for. If something is wrong, 
I think the citizens of the state of Illinois are counting on us to change it, you see. You know, the, the big issue that the U.S. Supreme Court is wrestling on or wrestling with is what rights do women have to control their bodies? Now, you see, if you get a majority of women on that court, I'm sure they will do the right thing and they will tell us what is right. And see, therein lies the problem. You know, I, I was speaking to a group recently. I am not convinced that it's a good idea to have all the members of the U.S. Supreme Court from Ivy League law schools. There's a broad cross-section of opinion. They, they need somebody from the West, from a Western law school, from the Midwest, from the South. You know, this is a country of laws, not of men, but it takes all the men and women to make these rules. And I'm just a little concerned when we are limiting it to such a small group. Mr. Justice, thank you for being here. My name is Bill Mock. I've been on the faculty here for uh, just a little under 40 years. Um, and you've talked about your mentors, um, all of whom I knew, and they were incredible people and wonderful people. One of the challenges for law students is to figure out how to find those mentors. Doors opened for you because you had mentors. You grew because you had mentors. Do you have any advice for the students in this room as to how to seek out and, and how to judge whether somebody is going to be a good mentor for them? Well, I have to resort back to Justice Johnson. Justice Johnson said people should not reinvent the wheel. If you make a decision about a certain area of the law that you like, and if you know someone who practices in that area, then maybe that person will be a good mentor. What John, Justice Johnson was really speaking about is, he said, if you want to become a judge, then you should go ask someone who is already a judge and ask them what their recommendation is about becoming a judge. It also brings to mind a very good friend of mine. And I met him shortly after I le left my clerkship and a clerkship is a good way to start. I'd be remiss if I didn't add that. But my friend told me that having been a law clerk, I had a view from the top. He's absolutely correct. It really gives you a broad cross-section of, of opinions. You know, you get to see the other justices. You get to see them interact. More importantly, you get to see how these decisions are made. And you know how to go out and practice law, how to draft a complaint, you know how to do what's supposed to be done. There's something else that I brought. Justice Burke has all, also has had a great deal to do with this. The court celebrated its 200th anniversary last year. And this is a book that was published by the court's historian, someone that Justice Burke has worked with quite closely, and it's calling Adjudicating Illinois, and it says Justices of the Illinois Supreme Court. And it's a book that it might be helpful for people to look at. She talked about Justice Freeman being from John Marshall. Between 2000 and 2010, two members of the Illinois Supreme Court in Cook County were from John Marshall. There was also a Justice Fitzgerald. So this school has made a huge contribution to the judiciary. But I suggest that you get this book. We probably wouldn't have it without Justice Burke and John Lupton. And I, I guess, you know, I, I want you to know, if you want to read about me, Justice Burke's biography is in here. But mine is also in here. In fact, as she said, I'm the 117th justice, and mine is the last one in the book. 
seeing no more hands, um, I'd like to ask you two more questions and then leave a little bit of time for people to come up and, and chat with you privately if you, that, you're able to stay that, with that's, us. That's fine. You know, judicial independence is such an important concept in our democracy. What do you think is the biggest threat to our judiciary today? I think the biggest threat is, is money that is entering the system. The way our political system works, a lot of people are discouraged from getting involved. And you see, the question is about judicial independence, but I think we just need to talk about politics in general. It seems now in this country you cannot run for a major office unless you're a millionaire. Our country is not supposed to be run that way. Now, what is very pleasing to me is we have a system where we elect judges, and that's good, because they're elected from small things that we refer to as sub-circuits, some of them. This provides an opportunity for a lot of people to participate. What I would like to see is public financing of campaigns so that everybody is put on an equal footing and the electorate gets an opportunity to select the person that they think is best. I think all the participation is good, but I'm a little concerned about the way money influences so many decisions. But you see, a judge has a responsibility to be independent. You know, once, once you take the oath, you're, you swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Illinois. And that's a promise you make to the people and the citizens of this state. And, you know, you, you have a lot of power and you have to exercise. You know, you have to make decisions. I, I, I read, you know, I, I read what Martin Luther King said about this. You just have to do what's right. And you, you should not be concerned about the, the consequences. You see, if I had been concerned about the consequences and trying to do what I didn't think is right, then maybe the Supreme Court would have said, well, you're not worthy of joining us. You, you're not going to be an ind independent thinker. Well, if my dissents do nothing else, or those were not dissents when they reversed me, it, it's evidence of some independent, that I'm an independent thinker that I recognize who I am and whose I am. And, you know, to thine own self be true. You have to be the master of your fate and the captain of your own soul. My final question is, what piece of advice or what do you know now that you wish you could have told your law student self? that it's important to work a little harder than I worked when I was in law school. <laughs> that you have, well, you know, it goes back to the story about the tortoise and the hare. The hare was really speedy and ran and then took a nap. The tortoise took one step and he's kept on stepping. I always tell people I'm a judge under construction. There's always something that somebody can teach me. I have an open mind, I'm always willing to learn. It's impossible to know everything. I am, the, the answers though are there. So I consult with my law clerks, with my colleagues on the court. And I listen to what people that I come across in my day-to-day -day existence, what they have to say, and what their thoughts are. So it's just, you gotta work hard and you have to have an open mind and be willing to learn from other people. Well, Justice Neville, thank you so much for being with us here today. We really appreciate it.